Hello, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, I am joined by my fellow librarian from Children's, Jen, and we are both animal lovers, and we're going to talk about books with an animal theme. So, I know you have several cats, correct? Yes, I have two cats. I did have three, but I have two now. Are yes. cats like your favorite animal, or do you have another favorite animal? Or One of my favorites. I have so many. I really love all most animals. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a fan of frogs or snakes or any of the reptile groups, but I'm sorry. But I do love <laughs> all other animals. Yeah. Um, I think horses are fascinating. I love um, dolphins and sea creatures. Um, but I... Yes, I guess cats would be an animal that I do know best because I have them living with me. Yes. I'm fond of cats of all kinds. Yeah, I like, I am probably, I guess if I had to pick between cats and dogs, I like both, but Mm -hmm. my kids have dogs, so I'm more of a a dog person, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, especially big dogs. I love a big, floofy dog. Absolutely. (laughs) Any favorite breeds? You know what? I am I, my Instagram feed is filled with Bernese Mountain Dogs. So it's like you like one <laughs> video and then they just keep coming, but yeah. um, my son has the St. Bernard, so I see a lot of that golden mm-hmm. retrievers cuz they're just so fun. Um, Susan has a little mutt, but yeah, they're just uh well you also coordinate. I'm going to let everyone know our yeah. when the um, therapy dogs come to the library. Yes. So I feel like they're um, I've been doing it for at least 10 years. Um, I have a woman that coordinates for us here at the library, and we get at least 10 to 12 dogs um, for the program, and most of them are, are goldens. Mm-hmm. But I've known some of these dogs for that long of a time. So you you get to know them and their personalities and how wonderful and special they are. So that's not only a benefit for our community, but for for me, selfishly, I absolutely love them. Oh, I think the staff loves when yes. they come. Yes. Yes. And yes. Uh, the Goldens are fun, but we have, I know the Chocolate Lab, mm-hmm. Henry. We have a German Shepherd. Yeah. Like, I think a couple Collies or something. We have a lot of different kinds. So. Yes, we have Collies that are Crimson and Clover. <laughs> and we have Henry the Lab. And we have the um, Bo is our German Shepherd. Okay. Um, and we have a family that got a German Shepherd because they fell in love with Bo coming to the library. Oh, that is yeah. so fun. Yeah. So that's great. That's a great story. But it's a great way for kids that do have a fear of animals as well, and dogs especially, or a big dog, you know, to be able to come to the library and read or pet the animals and get a little bit of education, but it also gets them um, acclimated to the fact that not all dogs are scary. Right. Very good. Well, speaking of dogs, my first book is called Dog on It by Spencer (laughs) Quinn. And this one came out in 2009. And it's a mystery where it's actually written from the point of view of the dog. So I listened to um, an audio version of this and the audio actually comes, you know, like it's a guy pretending to be the dog, which is pretty funny. (laughs) Um, it has a 3.8 on Goodreads and over 22,000 reviews. It's it's very fast-paced, so once you start it, it's easy to just get sucked into the story. So it's a mystery, and um, our main star is Chet, who is a large canine school flunky. Um, it, the way he's described, it sounds like a German Shepherd with a black ear and a white ear. Um, he's fiercely loyal to his human, who is a private investigator named Bernie. He loves steak. He's kind of goofy. Um, he has f- dog friends in the neighborhood and mm-hmm. people friends. And he's always looking for food and treats. Um, his, his owner is Bernie Little. Bernie is a divorced dad. He's an interesting character. He was a West Point graduate. He owns his own detective agency. He is a former baseball player, and he drives an old Porsche that Chet assumes that he is going to get the shotgun seat, like that's his seat in that Porsche. (laughs) So um, number 14 is actually coming out in October of this month, so the series is popular and it's still going on. But what um, the plot of this one was, Chet and Bernie are hired by a mom, kind of a well-to-do mom named Cynthia, And her daughter, Madison, didn't come home from school. She's an honor student. 
she's kind of starting to become friends, like she's about that age, 16. So the mom is very concerned. Um, within, before the end of the night, when Chet and Bernie are checking out her room and the house, she actually comes home. But then within a week, she disappears again. And this time she doesn't come home. And the mom is absolutely frantic. Um, so Chet and Bernie are on the case. They get to meet like different people and they meet the, her, her father is a real estate tycoon. And when they go to meet him, he's almost trying to like push them away from the case and say, oh, she's just probably run away to Las Vegas or something. So both Chet and Bernie are very suspicious and rightly so of this father who was not mm -hmm. all he seems to be mm -hmm. um there's also a reporter named Susie sanchez who <laughs> kind of gets a little you know you can tell that there probably might be a romantic interest developing maybe later on and um she also brings good dog treats so chet likes her mm -hmm. um but it, if you're curious about what it would be like to think like a dog, because you're literally like in the brain of Chet, like trying to solve this mystery. Oh my gosh. Um, and there are some scary parts too, because mm -hmm. he does get separated from him. He ends up in the pound. You're kind of frightened for Chet, um, but it was really good. So it's kind of a unique mystery. I don't know of too many other ones. I know a lot of them have animals in the mystery, but I don't know of too many that are like from the written from the view. point of view mm -hmm. of the animal. So. Dog on It by Spencer Quinn. That's I liked fantastic. it. Yeah. So what is your first one that you well, have for us? My first book is a classic. Um, I enjoy reading a lot of uh, memoirs, and I enjoy reading historical fiction. So mm -hmm. this is one book is going to go that I'm going to talk about is in that vein. But this one is... Um, something many of you will be familiar with. It's called All Creatures Great and Small by James Harriet. Um, I found out some facts about James Harriet. A lot of you know him as the famous vet. He's considered one of the most famous vets in the world because mm -hmm. of his books. Um, his books, he's written many of them, but they're, they have never been out of print since 1970. Wow. They were published around that time. Um, they've been published in many different languages, but he you know, soon became a household name, but he wrote under a pen name, which was um, James Harriet. His real name is James White. And um, the characters in his books, which are very colorful and full of such, they're, they're just so vibrant. And um, there's a huge menagerie of characters in the book, which I absolutely love. But they, he changed the names and sometimes um, the sex of the people and the different animals because he wanted to protect right. the towns that he um, he worked worked in. in and because they would know who it was. But mm -hmm. so he did that and he did. Um, you know, it starts out where he's a young vet in Yorkshire, England, and um, it's a town called Derby, which is a made up town. Mm -hmm. um, he really worked in like Thirsk and a and a bunch of other towns right in that area, but it did take place in York. But a lot of it is also about the beauty of the land mm -hmm. that he was lived in and being from a different area coming to the rural, um, a rural area and working as a rural vet with, you know, his specialty was farm animals. Um, the stories and the things that he talks about are not only um, endearing, but you you see the the hardworking people that he came in contact with um maybe their view of doctors and veterinarians do they really know what they're doing mm -hmm. so in each um each little story he tells is all about a different farmer a different animal different experience but he also um works for a man called Siegfried and his um brother Tristan who is a character and is the fun loving one that right. um, comes home from college and he has a tendency to drink too much beer mm -hmm. and he loves women and but he also loves animals and is a friend to, to James and they really get along but he, uh, he does not get along with his brother Siegfried so mm -hmm. the, the, the tension between them is often funny Yeah, uh, and Siegfried is um, an excellent vet he's basically James' mentor uh, but he's also 
um, a little bit too loose with the purse strings at the at the practice, and he tends to have a, a personality that he'll just explode. It's almost comical, but right. he does. He gets over um, exuberant about things. So, but his specialty is racehorses. Okay. So, and um, that has actually been. It started years ago. I remember watching with my parents. We right. loved it, and I read all the books. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's like been revived as like a new series on television. Yes. Like there's a new version of this show. PBS airs All Creatures Great and Small. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. And a lot of people have fallen in love with the book series again by watching that. And right. it is very close. The The storylines on the TV show, which, of course, I've watched, mm-hmm. um, are very very close to the book. The book, it, some of the things have changed, um, and some of the animals have changed uh, in circumstances from the series to the book. But it is very close. Like I recognized a lot of the storylines. Yeah. Yes, and his love interest is Helen Alderson, uh-huh. just like in the book. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to kind of revisit those books and also watch the new series and see how it stacks up against the old one. Yes, it's a it's really a um, endearing read. I loved reading about the stories of of things that he had to do with the animals. I mean, he'd he'd get up in the middle of the night and be called out to a farm to deliver a baby calf. Mm-hmm. Um, it's freezing cold. He has to take off his shirt. They're they're dealing with this. Takes place in the 30s, so they didn't have the equipment that they have today. Right. Um, but then talking about the beauty of the animals, and really that's what it was all about was. Um, his his relationship with the farmers and with the animals and his love for animals and and their dignity and you know awesome safety so yeah. um, some of the stories were really amazing and you do learn a lot as well yeah about I didn't know so much about cows or or horses or chickens or pigs and how pigs can throw a fit and actually have a temper tantrum. I didn't know pigs could have temper tantrums, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. That, so. That's fun. Yeah, the stories are wonderful. I would highly recommend it. Okay. Well, my second one is kind of written about almost the same time. And another coworker, Jenna, recommended this. It was called My Family and Other Animals by Gerald Durrell. Mm. And I listened to this one on Hoopla. I think this was also made into a movie or a TV series. Mm-hmm. Um, but it starts out, it's like so funny because this, I can just picture the people and hear their accent. And, and the oldest son, Larry, is like, what we all need is sunshine, a country where we can grow. Yes, dear, that would be nice, agrees mother, not really listening. And then he suggests they go to Corfu, Greece, and they all pack up and go to Greece, which (laughs) I'm like, who can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So they didn't really like the British climate. It was a whole big family of them, and the youngest son is Jerry, who Jerry is like a budding naturalist, and they decide that he's going to be homeschooled. So he's pretty much like running wild on this island, and he's capturing all kinds of things. That was the only thing that bothered me is because Jerry... Like, he would find a turtle's nest, and he would take one of the eggs. And I'm like, oh, oh, Jerry, no, you can't do that. But he did, you know, or a bird. He got a scorpion and ended up having babies and then escaped all over their dinner table, you know. But um, I found out that the... um, they were born in India. The father, I think, when Jerry was three years old, because the father's never mentioned in this. And I'm like, where's the father? Mm-hmm. I had to look it up online. Like, the father died when he was three years old of, like, a brain hemorrhage. Oh, um, so it's just the mom and all of these kids, and they literally, like, move from villa to villa because the oldest son decides he wants to have a bunch of friends come, so they all come from Britain and they stay, so we sh- it's like, well, we don't have enough rooms in, in this place. So they buy a bigger house. So <laughs> that was the only thing that didn't age well for me because I'm like, I just don't know how you would afford to do this no. today. Um, so they have all different kinds of animals, uh, dogs, birds, beasts. You know, a lot of them Jerry keeps in his room. And... Um, <laughs> You learn about the other family members, and gradually one of the older brothers has a friend there that becomes a tutor to him, so he learns a lot of 
scientific things and starts to learn more about the animals. But I would be curious to see how this was portrayed on TV. I've never seen the series. Uh, I listen to it, and it comes across as kind of almost slapstick, you know, because it's mm -hmm. just so crazy. You can't imagine it. But, um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. A lot of people love it. They've read it, you know. I kind of gave it, I think, a 3 or a 3.5 because some of the things that Jerry did in the book don't sit with me well now, but I'm looking right. at it from a perspective of, okay, it's 2023 now, and we think about these things a little bit differently. Yes, um, right. But yeah, it was interesting. I can't imagine like living. Now I want to go see what Corfu is like. <laughs> oh, yes. Who wouldn't want to go to Especially Greece? Especially considering like all the different kinds of flora fauna in that area too. right mm -hmm. especially yeah. if coming from like your native homeland where it's a lot of terrestrial animals and then you go to corfu i mean yes you're introducing a lot of different things right. outside the wheelhouse there mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's what was so fascinating to him was to have all of these different things that he could study and do what he wants and eventually he becomes like this book series continues mm -hmm. kind of like all, All creatures, creatures great and yes. small, where it takes him to the next point in his life where he finally does have to go mm -hmm. away to school. But I read that he goes back to England. He became like a chairperson of an endangered wildlife fund. He did work in a zoo. So he kept this love of animals and everything all throughout his life. So, I, you know, it was interesting. Yeah. I would probably read more. That sounds like a great series. I have seen the series advertised on PBS also. I know okay. that's something that they've shown there at All one right. point. Yeah, and it looks uh, like there's a 2005 film. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like a bunch of British folks that I don't recognize. Yeah, that's. it sounded to me like it would be a PBS like Masterpiece Theater or mm -hmm. like a Brit, I think it's a Masterpiece. Yeah. Brit Box type thing. Right. So. Yeah. That sounds exciting and fun yeah so what's your next one my next one um was a delightful read um it does have i will say if you do read the book that i'm going to talk about um there are some really difficult um uh scenes and that the author talks about in this and they have to do with um spousal abuse so mm -hmm. i would preface that you know um they're wonderful stories, but it is a rough, this woman had a very rough upbringing with um, the mother and father. So okay. my book is called Funny Farm, My Unexpected Life with 600 Rescue Animals by Lori Z Zaleski. And she actually, if you, you can look this up on the, um, the web, there is an actually actual funny farm. It's in New Jersey and mm -hmm. it is run by her. She does. She has more than 600 animals right now, but it's really a story of her um, growing up from a young child up until today, and in, interspersed with the story of her parents and and a very rough divorce and some abuse. Um, there's stories of each animal she rescued, and she names about 10 different. Um, animals okay. um, along the way. I and have each this of them one. has yes, and, and I want to read it. It's oh, like it's sitting so at good. myself, staring at myself. Now I'm going to be more more motivated. So these are animals that were either found on the side of the road, neglected. Um, people have gone to farms and seen. Uh, I think there was an emu um, that she, oh no, a llama that she found that was left at a farm and the, the people had moved away and it oh, was no. not being fed. It had moldy um, wheat to eat and it was it was not taken care of. So she did take it on at the funny farm. But the story, um, this all stemmed from her mother, Annie, who was a lover of all animals and um, taught her how to be strong and independent. And she watched her mom go through some really traumatic experiences, but kept the family together and they stayed strong and they lived in a very um, poor situation when they moved away from their dad. Mm -hmm. um, they lived in a little tiny cottage, but it had a lot of land and that's where the animals start coming in because um, people would bring 
like I think it started with a horse. Okay. Shannon was her name, and um, she was the mom's beloved horse. And they took in the horse. She she started to care for the horse. She she learned. She was like self studied um, with animals, and just it came from there. She would take in animal after animal, and I think they had sixty on their oh, property. Wow. Um, at one time, but they learned how to take care of pigs, chickens. They had a number of dogs, maybe six dogs at a time. They had cats. They took in kittens and any any kind of animal that had any kind of neglect or or defect that was brought to them. Now, so. how do people pay for this? Because just I'm trying to think of like all the food that these animals would mm-hmm. require. So, did she get like community support? For what she was doing, or she found a way to feed the animals. I think Lori touches on this, but she did find a way to feed them through um, means people would give her. Okay. She knew of a person. She, she people really loved her in the area as mm-hmm. well. Um, but yeah, she worked really hard. I think some of the food might have been grown, but she. I wondered that as well because that yeah. is very expensive, right? Um, but all the whole family pitched in and helped. So these kids were really hardworking children, um, and it talked about how embarrassed Lori was at one point of her um, situation, being that you know they had all these animals and and um, they didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have the things that other kids had, but turns out the other kids thought it was fascinating and amazing that their mom had all these animals and Mm -hmm. you know their own horse and who you know who has that so it turned out that their mother was actually um involved with a lot of the kids and taking she even took in some children that were um not well cared for in their home so she was an amazing woman but she her love of animals transferred to um Lori and she became that's why the dream of starting the farm sanctuary came about so her mom I'm assuming passed away yes and now she has this new funny farm so what happened is in the story um as Lori goes along she's such a hard worker she becomes a businesswoman and is very successful and um her mom and her still lived together and had a very close relationship. And she knew her mother's dream was to start, have her own farm and rescue animals. And she still did that on the side. She would work and then she would come home and take care of animals. So both of them loved and were very involved in that kind of a mission. So um, when she got to a point, she realized this is what I want to do. She um, ended up putting a, bid on this one farm that became the farm but it was this other company kept outbidding her and wanted the property so her mother was the one she she had um brain cancer at the time and her mother said don't give up on this you know keep trying and she finally put one more bid in and a woman helped her it was like a government um thing but anyway she ended up getting the farm and the her mom passed away a couple weeks later But when she moved in, she knew that her mom was still with her Mm -hmm. in some way. So it was really neat. And then just hearing the stories of the animals that she had um, and that came to her and their different personalities and how each one of them are special and unique um, in their own way. Um, And some of the misfit pairs that are together, like there was a, a blind kitten that came to them and a duck is her seeing eye duck and she follows the duck around (laughs) there's a horse and i want to i want to get the name right i want to say the horse's name is shadow socks is the horse's name and socks is a beautiful all-white horse who floats around the farm he's known as the guardian angel and he makes you feel things that you once only heard about There's something special about this horse. He followed one couple around all day and kept nuzzling this woman's abdomen and stomach, and they couldn't figure out why. Well, they called Lori after and said she found out she was pregnant a few weeks later. So there's just some really special stories about animals. Another funny pair I would like to talk about is, um, and there's a story behind them too, is Yogi the Steer 
with his big horns and Cooper, the alpaca, his best friend. <laughs> so, I mean, and you'll see these animals going around the farm. Um, but you learn so much about, she talked a lot about pigs and how difficult they are to wrangle mm -hmm. as well. Um, and she said she, she knew why people must watch, um, like when you grease up a pig and yeah. try to catch it. Yeah. She realized why that would be funny because they're almost impossible to catch. Yeah. And they don't like to be moved and their own personalities in their own way. But she did talk about how bright they are and how smart pigs are and actually how they they do they are actually clean animals yeah um they just like being in the mud for the protection on their skin huh um that but, reminds me of the place you've been there a couple people yes. from the staff what is that place called that's called the farm sanctuary oh, okay it's in watkins Glen, mm -hmm. and they rescue farm animals some farm animals literally jumped off a truck Right, that and, were going to be slaughtered, and they've rest. They have some amazing stories there. It is a beautiful place. Yeah, but that's a place locally that you know what about an hour, hour and a half away yep. that you can worth go visiting. And see. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. One more animal I want to talk about is Skunky the Skunk, <laughs> Stinky the Skunk, and Stinky the Skunk was brought to um, Lori because its owner, who adopted him, had taken the smell. The smell, like whatever, it, that's their defense, though. Right. Had taken it out of the skunk, and it was in an indoor skunk. Well, it was keeping him up at night because skunks are nocturnal, and right. they do all of their best work at night. And it was opening cupboards and lifting lids and making all <laughs> kinds of noise. So he brought he brought the skunk to Lori, and she made um, an amazing outdoor. Uh, they, they created an outdoor area for the skunk, and it's quite the, um, it's very friendly, and it loves to see people. But, um, you know, you could never release something like this in the wild right. because yeah. that's their defense. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was so such a funny story about Stinky the skunk. Yeah, well. But he's not stinky at all. Yeah. I, um, my brother brought home a baby opossum once. And he and I kept it upstairs <laughs> in our bathtub and we're feeding it and everything, trying to hide from my mom. But that's the thing is they're nocturnal too. So one night she heard a lot of racket and came upstairs and <laughs> yes, we were discovered and had to set it, set it loose. <laughs> so that was a, uh, it used to actually run up my arm and sit on my head. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, my last one is also set in England, and it's called The Invincible Miss Cust by Penny Haw. I listened to this one on Hoopla, and this is a great historical fiction. If you like the author Marie Benedict, um, I'd suggest this one, because this one is based on a real person, mm -hmm. and it was Great Britain and Ireland's first woman veterinary surgeon. So Aileen Cust, and this is in the 1860s, like late 1860s. Um, she, they lived in Ireland to start out, like her father kind of took care, was an overseer, like on an estate for someone. And her mom did not want to spend money to have a governess to come for Aileen, so she let her study with her brothers. So she was able to get quite an education because she had access to the same tutors and everything that her brother did. Plus, she always had all kinds of animals and horses and mm -hmm. everything on this farm, like at her disposal. She was a better wow. horsewoman than her brothers. Like she would beat them regularly in races. <laughs> she had dogs. Um, so she absolutely loved animals, and her grandmother actually was very talented with animals, and although she wasn't officially a veterinarian, she was kind of known in her community in England for taking care of animals. So she kind of felt like she had that in her blood a little bit, but when she expressed a desire to her parents um, that she wanted to pursue this, they were like, oh, no, this is not proper for a young aristocratic woman. Mm. What well, ends up, her father died suddenly. They had to leave Ireland and go back to England. And then she was assigned, like, one of her father's friends was her guardian. Um, and that family was very supportive of her dream of becoming a veterinarian. So she, 
she really struggled. Like her mother still kept pushing men in front of her, <laughs> trying to get her to get married. She just didn't want to do it. She really wanted, she said over and over and over that she wanted to become a veterinarian. Um, so finally, she enrolls in college. She enrolled under a different name because it would have been so shameful for her family to have this woman educated. And she mm. put up with a lot of abuse from fellow students. She did make some really good friends that stayed friends with her for life. But she had to put up with a lot because the people just you know, wouldn't, A, believe that she did it, but she did devise things like they kept saying, oh, a woman can't, and she loved horses. So, you know, being not just a veterinarian, but a large animal vet right. is is challenging. But um, some of the slings and everything that they have were from her that she devised so that she could do that type of wow. work. So um, it really was very well-researched, Um the only thing I didn't like about it is when she went to Ireland, there was a man to, that took her because they wouldn't give her her actual, like, accreditation or degree. Mm -hmm. She had to wait about 30 years to get that. And then they finally gave it to her. So she became the first woman surgeon. But she literally practiced almost her whole life without that final piece of paper mm -hmm. because they just were like, nope. Even though, and she scored like the highest marks in her class, but they just, because she was a woman, they wouldn't do it. Right. Um, so she, she goes to Ireland again. She starts this practice with this man. His name was Willie. And I am not sure. They kind of made it romantic in the book. And you don't know whether that was really true or not. You know, that was the one thing. I don't mm -hmm. know whether that was made just because this was a fictional book or whether... That was a life she had, but um, she ended up, she never married. Um, she had opportunities, but um, really wanted to stay true to her, her, you know, career. And, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was really good. We did it for the H historical book club on Facebook. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ones that we read. So it is available. We have the book here in the library and also mm -hmm. on Hoopla. And the um, audio version was very good, but... It's just shocking to think what women went through. Absolutely, Just yeah. to have any kind of life or independence. Mm -hmm. um, literally, she had to depend on money from her guardian because even though, like, her father and eventually some of her brothers died and had given her money, but she could only spend the money if her guardian decreed it. Like, it really wasn't her own money to spend. You weren't allowed to be independent and... No. Oh, and the other thing her is her mom was um, a, like a lady in waiting to the queen. So it was especially wow. shameful for her to have this, her daughter want to, you know, become a working person mm -hmm. <laughs> in her mind. But the funny thing was, is the queen at that time, you know how this queen liked corgis, the, the queen we just had, Queen Elizabeth? This one liked Pomeranian, so she started breeding them, and then they, they liked that. They wanted, like, her dog. She kind of got to be known for that, um, so that was kind of funny. Is you know They would talk to her about the Pomeranians, not so much about anything else, but it was very sad. I did read in real life, like, her mom never, like, once she did that and went to school, even though she used a different name and everything, they, they broke ties like, they didn't want to talk with her, her brothers. They didn't have a relationship with her. It was very sad. It was like, wow, you know. It's amazing. Yeah. One thing I like about historical fiction is you really learn about certain time periods. Um, if it's a, a really good book where they've done their research, it's um, it's fascinating to see how some, a woman in that time period lived. Right. And couldn't have independence or earn her own living right she was dependent on her status or how much she would inherit mm -hmm. or or being married yeah and it is interesting what what i to me a good historical fiction is one that makes me go off and start yes. researching yes, to absolutely. find out what was true and what was not true right and i have to say like the author's notes at the at the end were very detailed to let you know like how she found out certain things or what was you know not a whole lot was known about her personal life. So that's why she said, 
this is what was assumed, but she wasn't 100% sure, but that's what she put in the book. And that's what I love about historical fiction as well, is yeah. you, you get to learn about a certain time period. Yeah. That's a good intro to my my book, um, which I'm partway through right now, and it's called A Light Beyond the Trenches uh, by Alan Halad, who wrote um, A Long Way Home. Right. About the carrier pigeons and the use of them during World War II to... Mm-hmm. Um, send secrets back and forth without the Nazis realizing they were sending secrets. And that was um, fascinating. Yeah, I read that one after you recommended yes. it and with the Historical Club, and they all loved it. It, it was, was very a, good. What a great book and what a great story. And it all stemmed from a couple finding a bird with a canister tied to its little leg in, in their... Um, I want to say it was in their house they were doing renovations and they found the remnants of the canister and they realized it had a message in it. And Mm -hmm. then he saw the article in the paper and decided to write about that that subject. But anyway, uh, my book is The Light Beyond the Trenches and it's about the start of the first seeing eye dogs. And um, it was, and they called them guide dogs at the time. During mm-hmm. World War One. many of the soldiers came back blind oh, wow. and were visually impaired. And it takes place in Germany. Um, and it there's a, a female involved, Anna is her name, and she, um, she does have a good relationship with this doctor that is um, starting the whole program with mm-hmm. the dogs and training the dogs. And she has a special relationship with the animals. And it's really about her connection with them and that she, um, you know, when she gets to know some of the dogs um, and she befriends a soldier and it's kind of about their relationship, but also um, her training of the dogs and respect and love for them. And then the distrust of the doctor, but I won't get into that. So there's it has it has a lot to do with the war, but it also shows you the benefit um, to those who are visually impaired for the first seeing eye dog. Mm-hmm. You know that's when a lot of that started was wow. with war victims. So it was very interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to read it. I thought it was a great it sound it's a great storyline once again. Yeah. And not I don't know a lot about World War One. A lot of what I read is World War Two. So right. this was very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to read about. Yeah, and I never even realized how seeing eye dogs or that whole program started. So that's Mm-mm. interesting to know too. Yes, exactly. But how um, special and attuned animals are that they can be trained in that way. Mm-hmm. And there's animals that are trained to sense someone who's having an issue with their diabetes or someone right. who has epilepsy, yeah. um, It's to me it's fascinating and it shows um, the beauty of animals and and how they are actually intelligent yes. creatures and also emotional. They have emotional intelligence as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, that was fun. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, a lot of good books to be added. So if you like animals, be sure to check out some of the books that Jen and I talk about and let us know what you think. We always like hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the last month that we're just doing one episode per month. So in September, we're going to go back to two episodes and we will be doing a fall preview with librarian Stephanie for our next visit. But thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Gray.